bring Bill Means up here uh, to uh, talk about uh, the schools I and mean, the efforts that we've got going on in Minneapolis. I'd like to just comment just briefly about this period of time. Uh, there is nobody in, in, in the United States that, that actually believes that Columbus discovered America. Uh, but the continuation of this myth and the, the continuation of the lies that comes out of textbooks and the assumptions, you know, that it, they leave us with assumptions that Columbus had something to do with, with discovery. And, and you and I know that uh, that is a myth and it's an absolute lie, but, but 500 years have passed, you know, and we were doing some research and 100 years ago, this same kind of uh, uh, hysteria and this, uh, all this hype about discovery was being played over and over in uh, the Eastern newspapers. And here, 500, another 100 years later, 500 years ago, the same myth is still going on and on and on. And soon, you know, you and I are going to have to demand that, uh, that, they, that they terminate, that they end this kind of myth. Uh, because, I mean, it's, it's very plain to realize that, very easy to realize that Native people were in this continent for many, many, for, well, I say forever. We've been here all the time. And there's another theory about the Bering Straits theory, that Indian people came across the Bering Straits. <clears throat> I call that the BS theory. And, you know, I don't know how, the, how long, you know, we have to see, keep seeing this. It's like credits rolling after a movie, you know, about discovery. But <clears throat> the word discovery is what I, I would hope that you as individuals would take into your own heart about what this continent is about. There's for, for you non-Indians and for the Indian people who have been in this area all your life, I would invite you to visit, you know, other parts of North America other parts of this continent and began to see and, and, and feel the presence of, of the culture that is inherent in the land of North America. And come out to, to visit the Ojibwe people. Come out to visit the Lakota people or the Winnebago's or the Sac and Fox. Or, or the people, the Navajos, the Mescaleros, further on east to the Cherokees in North Carolina, or to the Six Nations in upstate New York. Discover, you know, the, the heritage of this country. For many years I've been traveling about in this country, visiting many people, <clears throat> and I think that the most important, impo most important thing that I've, that I've realized is that there's a lot of decent people out there. You'll find them in the small towns, rural towns of America, the back roads, and you'll find them in streets in Seattle or Minneapolis and Chicago. And I know that fighting with the American Indian movement for many years, I've seen the kinds of injustices that have hurt, that have hurt us for a long time. And I've seen and, and been a victim of the dual system of justice in this country. But I can't allow that to cloud my, my vision of tomorrow. I can't allow my, that to cloud my, my, my path. There are many races in this world, and our beliefs and yours is that there are, there's four directions in this world, and there are four, four races of man. 
mankind, humankind. But sometimes we have a tendency just to, we, we don't want to go outside of our area. And we urge our children to stay in school so that they would, you know, go on to graduate and become whatever, whatever it is that they'll become. And I do that with my children. And sometimes I push too hard my own children. And I want them to stay in these schools, yet I know sometimes these schools are very dangerous in terms of what they're teaching. And so every now and then I have to go to the schools and remind these teachers about who Native people are. But I think the, as you grow, as you grow older, you'll begin to see a vast people, a vast continent out there. And it's that kind of discovery that I would invite you to take. Yes, you know, even, even to leave, even to leave your, your hometown for about a year or six months or wherever. I was born on the Leech Lake Indian Reservation so many years ago. But yet I've traveled about and been knocking around different uh, places and going to concerts with Floyd and uh, bumming around and catching freight trains out of Minneapolis during the late 50s and 60s. And I've seen, seen a lot of people. And it's those memories that I have of the kindness uh, that makes me keep going. And the question, how can AIM, you know, how can the members of the American Indian Movement face the injustices and still carry on and still have a good time? Well, of course there's the ugliness of, of injustice found in every corner of this country. But if we dwell in those corners and stay in there, then of course we, we won't grow intellectually or culturally or you know we we will limit ourselves in our friendship so that's for the young people there's there is more to this country than than yelm washington there's more to this country than washington state and i i would invite you to travel about and sometimes you know if you, you don't have the money well i know a lot of times when floyd and i and you know, we didn't have any money either, but we had our thumb out there, you know, hitting that highway. And, you know, and Fred Morgan and I catching freight trains out of Minneapolis, going to Duluth or Milwaukee. So, see, there is a lot to see. It's a roundabout and a long way of saying that, that the drugs and alcohol that, that you might be introduced to and that you might take mental trips with them, they're false. And you know, sometimes you'll never come back from those trips. And that's what hurts me, is to see our young people that, that are going down that path. But anyway, that's my, my feelings for the, for the moment. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce to you to, uh, to Bill Means. Bill um, has been a longtime friend of mine, and it was only this afternoon that I, that I found out after all these years, some 20 some years that went by before uh, when Bill Means come back from the Vietnam after serving a tour of duty over there, and that he came back, and his, when he came back, he stopped here and at this military station over here. And after doing all that combat tour in, in Vietnam, uh, they asked him to, uh, they woke all these guys up early one morning, had them get in helicopters, and they were going to go uh, to to this uh, another town. Where was that? Fort, Fort Lawton. And Native people had taken over Fort Lawton. And Bill Means was one of those military commandos that they asked to come to and roused the Indian people out of Fort Lawton. And at that time, Bill made a statement to the military that he had been fighting in Vietnam for this country. 
and for freedom for people to express themselves in, in any fashion. And here, his first duty, not even 48 hours back from Vietnam, asking him to take weapons up against Indian people. And he'd, he'd read about the American Indian Movement. His brother, Russell Means, and I were in, we were in Plymouth, Massachusetts. We were protesting the Mayflower. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's another story. <laughs> but anyway, Bill, Bill Means, longtime friend from Minneapolis, uh, member of the American Indian Movement. So, Bill, where you at? Bill Means. I'm a doctor, I'm particularly Chantema Wash Day now, pay Chuzak still. I always like to give that traditional greeting in one of the classical languages of the Western Hemisphere, known as Lakota. I'm Lakota from the Black Hills in South Dakota. Where I come from is seven miles north of Wounded Knee, where with Dennis and others we we stood up in 1973 for the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. And you know, we've uh, never really looked back from that point. Right now I live in the city of Minneapolis, where we struggle with many of the same problems that you have right here in this community. The issue of gangs, our Indian people getting involved in violence and crime, many times against their own people. And so we have to go back to the younger ones in our schools and try to divert them from choosing that, that alternative of the gang scene. I try to tell our students in our school, which we founded in 1972, it's called Heart of the Earth Survival School. And the reason why it was named that by our students was because they believed our culture and our language our way of life should survive. And so they named the school that. But in our school, we have come to deal with this issue of gangs and we're not always successful. But I think one area we were successful by the programs that we run, such as a community patrol, that's all volunteer known as the AIM Patrol. We patrol the streets of Minneapolis South Side on Friday and Saturday nights and any night that it looks like there's a lot of Indian people out on the streets. Minneapolis has probably the second largest urban Indian population in the United States. And it also has probably the only urban Indian population that's pretty much centered in one area, which is the near south side. So we have a lot of problems that are common to Seattle, Tacoma, and the nearby reservations. We even have what they call gaming, as you're seeing, being implemented here in the form of bingo. And of course, people always criticize Indian people for getting into bingo or using our regulatory authority that flows from our treaty rights. But nevertheless, uh, gaming is here it's kind of interesting, the whole field of gaming, because you always read articles about, oh, it's a bad business. We better not get involved in gaming because it's, it's all full of organized crime. While to Indian people, we've been dealing with organized crime since 1492. So one form of organized crime uh, is not really different from another. And so now we have gaming. And it's kind of amazing because you know how gaming started was by bingo. And you know who legitimized bingo on Indian reservations? The Roman Catholic Church. So all of you that are Catholics, take a bow. You're the one that brought gaming to Indian reservations and legitimized it. So the church has a role to play. 
we don't argue the issue of religion in our movement, in our Indian communities. We only argue the misuse of the institution of religion. And so we've always challenged the churches to maybe share some of their property, like on my reservation in Pine Ridge where the Roman Catholic Church is the largest single landowner. Many of these reservations that were checkerboarded and had land bought up by the churches now need the church to establish a return to land to the Indians program. Since they're not doing any more in terms of social change, they just as well give us back the land. But again, to our communities in Minneapolis, where we started our school, because we grow tired. You know, there was a great chief one time, I think his name was Tecumseh. He always talked about the promises that the government made. And he made a very famous quote. He said, we grow weary of words that come to nothing. And that always comes to mind in dealing with school boards, personally. Because for years we challenged school boards about racist curricula. And of course they said, well, we like to change that, Mr. Means. But do you realize to change a sixth grade history book in this district would cost us a neighborhood of $600,000? So there was always the monetary question. And so finally, under a court order, because we had withdrawn, some of our parents had withdrawn their children from school in protests because they wanted them to cut their hair. They were being discriminatory on the implementation of discipline policies and many other charges. And the judge said, unless you find an alternative for these children, the parents will be jailed for contributing to the delinquency of a minor. And that's how we found it, Heart of the Earth Survival School. We had to live up to our own rhetoric one day and roll up our sleeves and get involved in education. And it hasn't been easy, but we just celebrated in January our 20th year of operation of a fully credited K-12 Indian school right in the heart of Minneapolis, Minnesota. where we teach three Indian languages and Spanish language. We teach culture in every classroom, whether it's math, science, language arts, whatever the class. Instead of a band, we have Indian music. And we have an Indian music instructor. His name is Johnny Smith from Red Lake. He also runs our drum and dance club, which has over 90 members from all 12 grades in our school. And so we're constantly asked to go around the city and urban area of Minneapolis St. Paul to make presentations, especially in this year of Columbus, the lost Italian. <laughs> so you know it is a lot harder to work in education than it seems. Because when it goes to finding curriculum that doesn't say Columbus discovered America, the only way we're going to get that curriculum is write it ourselves. And so through this year of 1492 has afforded us 500 years later the opportunity and forced us again to roll up our sleeves and tell the Indian perspective of Columbus. Which in our school we developed two curricula, one for three through sixth grade and the other one seventh through twelfth grade. And basically the foundation of our curriculum is the Indian nations that greeted Columbus. Many of you don't even know their names. It's the Arawak and Taino people of what is now known as the Caribbean. To talk about their societies and how they govern themselves. To print a little bit of their language so that some place Somewhere in the world, again, we could hear that beautiful Taino language. I remind our children that 
Indian people were subjected to many inhuman policies of Columbus and his band. Not to condemn Columbus and raise the issue of reverse racism amongst our own children, but to give them the truth of who Columbus really was and what his legacy is here in the United States. And so our school has developed, and we're still developing. Our dream is to have curricula in every subject, but we spend so much of our time trying to find the basic funds to keep the doors open that we don't get a lot of time for fancy programs and consultants to come in and, and write curricula for us. We have to write it on our break time between teaching classes. But there's no reward in politics, I know, that you get in a school when you see the smile on a child's face who can read for the first time but yet they're at the age of 16 or 17 years old. When a teacher calls you into the classroom, what I call the miracle of education, people who were pushed out, who dropped out of public school, who couldn't read or write even though they were in the best suburban schools in the Twin Cities, but they're pushed around because they were minorities, because people didn't know how to deal culturally with Indian people. And then they come to us. But then the teacher calls you in all excited and the students crying, the teachers crying, and I'm holding back tears and that girl's spelling some words that most of us would have trouble spelling. And she's reading sentences that she couldn't read when she came there four and five months ago. This is the beauty of Indian people helping Indian people. We can't stand around and try to blame white settlers or racism. Those things have a bearing. But we ourselves are responsible for healing our communities. And that's why I'm here because I think this is a special place. I know when that jet circled in to come into SeaTac there and you look out the window and see that beautiful mountain, you know it's a special place here. And when you're driving in from the airport and you see the trees, as you get to the Indian land, you see the trees are bigger and taller. And you get a feeling for the amount of medicine and sacredness. And then people tell you about the great treaty of Medicine Creek that affects the people and the land in this area. And you hear about Chief Leshai and his resistance and that in fact he wouldn't sign treaties and so what did they do to him? They hung him not too far from here. And so sometimes when you look at the issues that have come up in racism like Rodney King, I got to give you a few American Indian Movement experiences on the area of racism. In 1972 one of the first national Exposures that we had on racism happened in Gordon, Nebraska, where they brought in a young man into an American Legion dance hall on Saturday night and stripped him from the waist down and burned the bottom of his feet with cigarettes and said, Dance, Indian, dance. And they drug him out and beat him to death, and they found him three days later in a trunk of a car. And we marched on the city of Gordon to get an investigation. And eventually two brothers named Hare were convicted. By well, the time we got a call in Farmington, New Mexico, where they had a cult operating, a white racist cult, that in order to be a member you had to have a finger of a Navajo child. And they had found over 16 Navajo children with their fingers cut off in and around Farmington, New Mexico. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not talking about the 1800s. This is 1975 I'm talking about. We recently had a similar situation in a town not too far from Pine Ridge Reservation. 
again, Gordon, Nebraska. A young man was killed again by some white ranchers. And they just had a march on the town again, 20 years later. So the issue of racism is not unfamiliar to Indian people. If you look at history and some of the great so-called leaders, the same day that Amer Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, he signed a death order for 38 Sioux people to be hung, the largest mass hanging, mass execution, execution ever in history up until that time, the United States in Mankato, Minnesota. So history, these things our children have a right to know, not to be taught in a racist manner. I found out in our school, believe it or not, some of our best cultural teachers are non-Indians. I don't say this because our Indian people are not talented. I say this because young teachers, non-Indians, seeking out information and research, go out of their way to be thorough, out of their way to be correct and to consult with Indian people. And it's working in the classroom. My son comes home with two to three different languages he's speaking sometimes. He's only in second grade. And both of his teachers, this is his third, no, this is his first Indian teacher. His first two years was non-Indians. So we can do it together. We can learn from each other and teach each other. But here now we're faced with a guy that calls himself the education president. And look what he's done to education compared to the defense budget. There's always a famous poster that you see in most schools. It says, someday it will be good to see the, something to the effect that when the Air Force has to hold bake sales in order to build a B-1 bomber, and when education has the same priority as a B-52, See, these are the priorities that get mixed up in that where American Indian movement, we had to straighten them out a little bit for our own communities. So many of our people, we used to go around, raise a lot of hell all over the country. But our people, families begin to get bigger, like myself. And so we had to go back to our own communities and fight for not only social change, but for our own families. And that's why it's good to come here to see the families struggling together here. The Sundance Grounds. Many people have criticized the people of Yelm and the McLeod family for the Sundance. I speak to you as a Lakota that Sundance was given to us as one of the seven sacred ceremonies by the sacred white buffalo calf woman who brought us our pipe. But our medicine people have always told us that the sun dance belongs to everyone. And that remember one thing that makes our religion different from all other religions. We never had missionaries. We never tried to make an eagle out of a crow. And so the sun dance coming to Yelm is a partnership of families. It's a partnership of movement people, not trying to impose a religion, but to give opportunity for our families to experience their closeness to Mother Earth, their closeness to the spirit world, that relationship that all things are related. This is what the difference of philosophy of the American Indian and the white people is. We believe that because all things are related, we must build our nations, our systems of government, based on respect for all of life. When the white man came here, he said, hey, damn, I'm blessed with the power of reason. Therefore, I can manipulate, exploit, undermine anything above the earth, on the earth. And look what's happening. This is a difference in the philosophy. Whatever the white man has accomplished through science, 
the Indian has accomplished through spirituality. We are the protectors of Mother Earth. And one of my jobs before going to Heart of the Earth is I worked in the international community for nine years in the city of New York. You talk about some culture shock there now. Taking a res boy from Pine Ridge all the way to 42nd Street in New York City. It's quite a change. But we, we went to the international community because we had a question to ask the United Nations. Why is it that the red man of the Western Hemisphere is the only color of mankind not represented at the United Nations? And so we represented an international human rights organization called the International Indian Treaty Council. And we put forth the issue of treaties, which is our basis of nationhood, nation to nation. Treaties are not signed between movements between organizations, between labor unions. Treaties are signed between nations. And so when people, especially here in the Northwest, when we talk about water rights and fishing rights, you always hear these congressmen and news people talk about these outdated legal documents called treaties. Well, if treaties are outdated legal documents, then what about the Constitution? Because the Constitution talks specifically about treaties in Article 6. So we know history and the law is on our side. Justice is not. And those that interpret the law and history fail to recognize the sovereignty of the Indian nations. But it's coming. If you go south of the U.S.-Mexico border, there's over 100 million Indian people. So here on Turtle Island, the Western Hemisphere, where we were created as a people, as nations, we are not an insignificant minority. We have a destiny. And our role as International Indian Treaty Council and the American Indian Movement is to bring this consciousness, bring this pride, bring this self-help concept, to bring this militant, stand against racism to all corners of the Western Hemisphere. And now we even found out we have to take it to all indigenous peoples around the world. So what started as a little pitiful movement called the International Treaty Council has now become a worldwide movement of indigenous people. We're the only ones that have resources, clean water, timber, around the world. And so we hold the key to the survival of the human on this planet. We're trying to teach that to all races and especially to our own children. And so I thank the people of Yelm. It's been an honor to be here and experience the powerful medicine and to encourage the McLeod family to continue this great ceremony called the Sundance which is open to all of our Indian people, which is an opportunity to be close to the Creator, to give thanks on behalf of your family. And as Chief Sitting Bull, one of our great leaders, statesmen, said to his people, he said, let's put our minds together and see what life we can make for our children. Pilama Apollo, thank you.